Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Benjamin Stokes. Um, so the same people that we all count on to vote, to volunteer, to protest, these days they're also playing video games. And although there's a lot of conversation at this conference about games that specifically target civic behavior or learning games that have learning goals, maybe it's also time we step back a little bit and just ask, what about everyday gamers? What about mainstream gamers? What about people who play commercial games? What are their civic lives? And is there a connection between what happens in the game world and what happens in civic life? Well, it turns out that if you look at civic research um, over time, curriculum is often trumped by your relations with other people and the activity structures of our lives. So this, for example, there was a study done in Chicago that looked at a bunch of different programs in schools that all tried to build civic engagement, tracked the kids over time and said, looked years later and said, are they more engaged in civic life? Are they volunteering? Are they protesting? And so on. And what it found out is that none of the curriculum made as much difference as whether the kids were simply talking with their parents a little about politics. Um, small groups in particular are very powerful ways of having people build the passion and connections for civic life. Small groups have been called the crucible in which civil society is created and enacted. And I think bowling is an interesting example because bowling, how many people have read bowling alone out of curiosity? People familiar with the topic? So some people have. It's, very, it's a very popular and somewhat controversial book in sociology um, and in civic engagement circles. And the argument that's made is that when, as people are participating in bowling leagues, they're building social ties to each other and connections that then support them in their civic life and their civic engagement. And when we ask ourselves what can actually um, help people protest more, volunteer more, and so on, things like bowling leagues are actually hugely important. The thing if you think about bowling, though, is it doesn't have civic content. It doesn't smell like school, it doesn't smell like civics, it doesn't look like it. Bowling wasn't designed for volunteering. Bowling is just a game that you go and play. And I think that there's a real important thing that the Games for Change community needs to do, which is to think about regular commercial games and how they might be similar to something like bowling. By the way, Bowling Alone, really interesting book I recommend. However, it doesn't mean that every game works. 76% of teens report helping others while gaming, but this is not in every game. You know, obviously a single player game, it's hard to help other people. Um, but when you're in a multiplayer game, you can, and some games will actually encourage it. So MOBAs, or Multiplayer Online Battle Arena, is a particularly interesting type of game. Uh, this is a, a description that uh, some of my research colleagues at USC have come up with to describe these games, which we feel are akin to bowling in some ways. And these are massive games. Let me show you one of them. League of Legends. Uh, and a show of hands, how many people have played League of Legends? So that's a, that's a good number of people, almost half. Um, League of Legends is played by 1.4 million people daily. So I'll just let that sink in for a second, because I, I doubt any of the games that you're, um, are being talked about that are civic games have anywhere near that kind of scale, 1.4 million people daily. And if you look at how the game is actually played at this image at the top right, um, it's basically teams of 5v5. The, the five avatars in the top are going to play the five avatars in the bottom. Everyone picks their avatar. In this, you can choose an avatar that's more or less helping, kind of healing, um, gonna, that's going to go out and push. Uh, uh, and, and lead the charge. Um, these graphics are a little bit old, but they're from the time we did our, our study. They've, um, they've updated it since then. And the, the feel, for those who have never played a game like this, is it's a little bit like Capture the Flag. So with Capture the Flag, um, you try to basically move from one side of the field. If you're in the bottom left, you might move and try to capture the top right tower defense. So this game um, has uh, disproportionately young players. From our survey data, we found about 21 years old average, disproportionately male, disproportionately white and Asian, and a little bit on the richer side. To me, that's actually exciting, because this is kind of the stereotype for what gamers are. And there's so many stereotypes about gamers being disengaged, gamers being people who don't have a civic life, people who escape to games. And I, the reason that we did this work and I asked these questions was I was curious, are gamers actually disengaged from civic life? Or do gamers have a civic life? Well, when we ask, um, is there a bridge between games and civic life, we realize civic life actually has many pieces. You can be volunteering, you can be raising money, you could be peacefully protesting, you could be staying informed on current events, or doing advocacy. And so we asked about all of these questions. 
And, I, and we picked these questions in our survey to mimic a, sa a, same sur a similar survey that Pew had done just a few use years earlier, where they did a random digit dial and called up teens around the country. Some of you may be familiar with this, this study of young people and their video game use. It also interviewed their parents. And we were interested in look for a, finding a comparison group, because when you hear a number like gamers are volunteering at a rate of 23%, is that a high or low rate of volunteering? What would we expect? Well, we were interested in comparing them with some type of good old stalwart, good civic citizens. And uh, at least in my mind, parents fit that bill because parents are a group that is responsible for raising the next generation. Parents are also, if you look at the numbers, they tend to volunteer at fairly high rates because they are pulled into activities with their kids. They have these kind of social connections. And if we look, if we step back and we ask the question, not just about the past 12 months, but lifetime, have you ever protested? Um, well, people often can remember uh, over their lifetime average in a different way than they might recently. So we compared gamers from this game League of Legends from to parents. And what's exciting here is that when it's a big commercial game and the game company is working directly with you, which is a real privilege as a researcher to be able to work directly with a game company like this, we were able to get 20,000 responses to our survey. So it's, uh, I don't know if those of you that are researchers out there, but we often struggle to get, you know, 100 or 1,000 responses. 20,000 responses is kind of a massive data set. Um, and we were able to then start filtering down, just focus on the US, just focus on people the same age as parents, and start looking for this comparison. Here's what we found. So if we look at staying informed, we found that the gamers of League of Legends um, played, uh, are staying informed at a rate about 88%. Parents, 83%. So pretty comparable. Also pretty comparable for whether um, you've ever donated. Um, that's on the order of 75%. Whether you volunteer, on the order of 70%. And so this is actually a piece of data that I had never seen, and one of the reasons I was super excited about this was that it says, hey look, here are mainstream gamers, a bunch of young men who we think of as disengaged from civic life, but actually they're protesting at almost the same rates as this group American parents that we think of as good citizens. So I think that's actually a, a nice break with the stereotype that's out there about gamers being disengaged from civic life. This data shows they aren't. The curious one, though, is if we look at the, this last one, protest. So the um, gamers, these small group gamers, uh, protested, said about 25% of them, a quarter of them, said they'd ever protested. Parents, it was only 10%. Now, if this number was differing by just a few percentage points, I would probably have dismissed it as not that big of a difference. Um, but this is actually a massive difference. This is, a, this is twice the rate of protest for gamers, which is a really interesting and kind of head-scratching uh, result. Why would these gamers protest at such high rates? Well, the benefit of this big data is we can actually start testing a whole bunch of different theories with it. Protest, according to lit the literature, actually comes from several different things, and there are different theories that look into it. Of course, we worry about whether gender is a big issue, whether old people or young people are protesting more. We're curious about things like whether people that are registered to vote protest more, or whether if you're liberal, you protest more. We're curious about things, this is the bowling argument, if you build social capital and you have tight bonds with other people, does that give you the um, structural availability to protest more? Well, games may be distinctive in this role, and that's what I was really interested in looking at. Um, what I'm interested, however, is a type of research that I might call mathematical ethnography. This, is, it, this goes beyond what a lot of people do with evaluations, which is simply try to say, did it work or didn't, kind of looking backward. I'm interested in looking forward, and I think that I think this kind of work is often more useful for Games for Change. We can say, what kind of games should we build next? Where should we go from here? And so I think a lot of this kind of data is so rich, it points to some area that we should be building more games in the future. Here's an example of what the data looks like. So it's, as you can see, it's like finding diamonds in the rough in some ways, um, even though I actually handpicked all of these different questions. Um, Here's what, if we start pulling in the numbers, it very quickly becomes one of these things where you want to sit down and spend hours poring over the data. But again, I think it's worth that time. It's worth finding researchers who can help you look at your data and at commercial games. Here's an example. Initially, we saw, and this is predicting protest, um, and what we saw is that education initially seems to be uh, a predictor. So if people are more educated, they're protesting more. More years of school, more likely to protest. But then when we added more factors into our model, and we started looking at it in more depth, the 
influence of education went away. And so what may look to the uh, untrained observer like something where education is a big predictor of protest turns out other things that are associated with education are actually responsible for the fact of um, this higher rate of protest. Um, which in some ways is reassuring because it's great that people will protest in some ways regardless of education. So um, here's where we can actually get to effect size, um, which for those of you that are researchers, just the fact that there's a relationship isn't as interesting as when we ask how big is the relationship. I was interested in whether the values that people have in the game translate to outside the game. So we asked about their altruism in the game. We asked about are they healing characters when they choose avatars? When they're playing the game with another team, are they on the, with their headset asking, um, you know, trying to keep an eye on other people's health? Or do they push ahead and count on other people to help them? And what we found is that um, basically, if you are more um, helpful in the game, the odds that you've ever protested are 5% higher. So in some ways, that seems like a relatively minor effect. But what's pretty cool is that we can predict higher rates of protest in the physical world based on whether or not they're doing things like picking healers in the game. Kind of a cool result. However, that's not as big an effect as um, liberalness. So if you say you're politically liberal, um, the odds that you have ever protested are 12% higher. And for those of you that have studied civics, this is, uh, confirms other findings that are out there. Protesting generally skews toward the liberal side of the political spectrum. Liberals tend to say that they protest more. But these are the kind of data that we can get where we can talk about the, the percent odds change when somebody does a particular action in the game. And what's cool with a game like League of Legends, when you partner with a commercial game company, there are hundreds of variables um, that we can start looking at. We can start asking things like, do they play with a spouse? Um, OK, does that change their odds of protest? Um, you know, how, about, how about the number of hours that they play? Well, here's another kind of cool thing. Is we can compare on the left column, protest, and on the right column, volunteering. And one of the things I want to leave with the audience is a recognition that civic engagement is not generic. It's not all the same. In fact, the causal factors behind volunteering are very different than the causal factors for protest. And I think we need to be careful when we're designing games that we don't just say it's encouraging civic engagement. We should specify what kind of civic engagement. Here's a couple of examples. If we look at these biographical availability factors, um, for protest, they're essentially non-significant for a sample of this size. In other words, whether or not you're male or female, whether or not how educated you are and your income is not making a big difference on whether or not you're likely to protest. However, they do play more of a role with volunteering. If we look at this um, item I mentioned before about values in the game, whether you choose to be a healer and so on, that um, has an effect on both sides. If we look at whether they've stayed informed, so basically whether they're following the news, uh, that doesn't affect protest, but it does affect volunteering. Whereas if they're aware of the, the Game Voters Network, which is kind of free speech for, for gamers, a number of you may be members of the Video Game Voters Network, um, this does affect the odds that they've protested, but it has no influence on whether they've uh, volunteered, or at least we couldn't find any. Uh, finally, to finish out, the folks who are very interested in bowling um, would be curious about social capital. And what we found here is that the social capital um, measures of things like bonding, whether I have people in my life that I trust, that I can go to when I have problems, um, when I'm, if I'm a member of organizations that have people I trust, and so on. Social capital, um, bonding social capital did not play a role in protest, but it did play a role with volunteering. So having a, a tight social fabric will get me to volunteer more, but not to protest. Um, one, um, oh, I if I can go back. Oh, I think we're just moving on. Here's a really interesting one, though. There's a, in the civic circles, one of the biggest concerns is hours, moderate hours. And um, for those of you that heard Jane McGonigal's talk, she talks about people playing for under 20 hours a week, or it might be 21. But in other words, it feels like there might be a threshold for healthy gaming. And I've never seen any data actually investigating this in terms of civic life. Um, so one of the things I was interested in is, does playing excessive amounts of games or playing a more moderate, healthy amount of games change your odds for civ various civic actions? Turns out, it does. Um, it, if you um, play less than 20 hours of, of video games, and this is not just League of Legends, this is all games, if you play more than uh, under 20 hours, you vol um, in the last year, the odds that you've um, volunteered 11% higher. Um, actually affects donation too, which was kind of a surprise to me, but doesn't seem to affect protest, which makes sense in some ways because protest doesn't take, take a lot of time. So in conclusion, gamers have a civic life. 
Um, and here's data that actually supports this. Uh, gamers aren't just disengaged from civic life, they're out there volunteering just as much as good old parents. Um, protest is high. Um, what is the cause of protest being high? Um, well, it could be just the spectacle of games is a bias. So the same people who like to protest like to play these kind of games. There's no causal relationship. However, there's a pretty exciting potential, which is what if games, in their ability to take, where they let us take on roles, to be a little bit confrontational with other people, um, and to know that it's gonna be okay to fail and we're gonna be able to come back, what if games help us build up tolerance for protest? I don't have data to confirm this either way, but I wanna flag this, put a red flag out and say, let's look into this more. There's some really interesting things going on here with protest, and the early research says, we need more games that are starting to look at whether or not we can affect protest with a game. I think the field needs more of this kind of research that does mathematical ethnography, not just looking at whether something works, but points to areas that we should consider. And finally, for those of you building games, I think that this research, especially with the difference between volunteering and protest, underscores the importance of really being clear what we mean by civic engagement. Games push certain kinds of civic engagement, certain kind of games, and I think we can, we can optimize that more and deliver better civic impact with it. Thank you.